Gig Gab, episode 319 for Tuesday, September 21st, Body Ya 2021. <laughs> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. As usual, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. I think this is the first show we've done on the 21st of a September, my friend. A legendary date in rock and soul history. In, in cover band history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if, we, if it's not the first time we've done it, then we have missed out. Because it's definitely the first time we've acknowledged that, at least as much as we have. So. Absolutely. I think we've done a May the 4th, right? We have done a, a Star Wars Day one. That's, yeah. yeah, I believe that's that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're on the way. We're going to cut, we're going to hit every possible date combination sometime. At some point. Yeah. Well, the, it, if we were always on Mondays and every Monday, eventually we would hit it. But like, like this week, we've shifted to Tuesday. So there are those, like, we would not have hit Body Ya Day. Uh, if, uh, is that what, is that what today is? Uh, if, um, do you remember if, uh, if we hadn't shifted the days, <laughs> sorry, I, I really, I really shouldn't be allowed to do this. <laughs> hey, I have a question. Have you seen that photo floating around of, uh, Phil Collins trying to perform with, with Genesis? No, I mean, I've seen, so they, no, you know, they, I'm missing they something. Started. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, he just doesn't look well. I mean, mm. if you look this this photo up, and it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I guess he sounds okay, but he really doesn't look well. And you know, I I wonder, I wonder about the relative value of having your rock heroes. Your last experience is it is it good for them? He's giving me one more time around. Or is it? Oh, you know, because it strikes wait, wait, me. I, as, wouldn't it be one more night? I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna head down that path. Yes. Okay. One more you. night. Right, because yeah. that's, that's that's you're on a roll today, man. I know. I can't yeah. help it. I, like I yeah. said, you should just mute my mic and do the, yeah. do the show yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're sitting here in the studio. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. We're, let's not do that, Dave. Come on, man. All right. Anyway, um, yeah, I just. Uh, you know, I love Genesis, and actually, I love Phil Collins. I, I think his yeah. voice has always been remarkable. Oh, he's one of the one of the best voices in rock and roll for sure, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. And, you know, and you know, his range with effort. I mean, you know, he sings high, and it's almost indistinguishable from a chest voice to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 so effortless. Anyway, and he wasn't um, really even supposed to be their singer right after Gabriel right. left. He they were auditioning singers, and he would. Uh, for the people that, you know, didn't come in, like knowing all their melodies, he would sing the melodies at the auditions for the people. And after, as the story goes, I, I'm sh I wasn't there. I, I'm sure I have all this wrong, but it's a good story. So I'm just going to tell it and we'll believe it for the moment. Uh, it, it, you know, after, I don't know, six or eight auditions, the, the, everybody in the band was like, well, nobody sounds as good as Phil. So uh, what do you think about crossing the backline Meridian Mr. Collins and you know, you go up there and sing some of the songs. And so that's eventually what happened, obviously. And and then yeah. and then his solo career happened, right? And and the eighties were a time of of many things, and one of them was inability to escape Phil Collins. For better and for worse. Well, he's he's definitely unique. I'm gonna send you this uh I got yeah, I've got a link to this thing. Yeah. Oh, you see it. It's I just it. I, you know I mean he's sitting in a chair know. and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he looks he doesn't look well, you know, but he's singing and evidently his voice is still strong, but I've got tickets to go see, I think their last, well, their last U S date maybe is, is somewhere sometime in, in December in Boston. And so we've got tickets to go see that. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. I know a lot of bands today marks 10 years since REM uh, called it quits. And oh, wow. yeah, I think, and they reposted some of the stuff that they uh, that they said at the time, and you know it. It all was very much. We feel like we've done everything that yeah. we wanted to do, and in in looking back on our most recent record at the time, 
which was their final record, they said, you know, that that's sort of a nice underscore to the whole, you know, draws a line at the at the end of our career. And we're happy with that. And um, and we want to go out with a legacy that we feel good about and we feel good about this. And, you know, Rush was the same way. I mean, of course, I'm thinking about bands that are, you know, were monumentally influential to me. And those two bands are are chiefly among them, perhaps the top, well, certainly in the top five, both of them. But, um, you know, they called it quits when when they mm-hmm. when they wanted to. Yeah. And on their terms on their terms. Yeah, it, exactly. Whereas, you know, we look at the Rolling Stones, who everybody said should have called it quits years and years ago. Uh, not everybody, many people. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but there, there are those who have said that. And then they go out and and play a tour and crush it. And it's like, oh, well, I guess they, you know, I guess they had another one in them. But yeah. Charlie was always the one who said, uh, you know, we always have to, to look at every gig we play as it might be the last one because I don't want to be out there doing it if we can't do it to our standards. And obviously now... Charlie's no longer with us. So uh, should the Stones be out on tour? I don't know. I haven't seen them. Couldn't tell you. you. Know, you know, but, but let me so. just ask you, I, I actually feel that it's actually quite disrespectful them to go on this tour without Charlie. Would they have done this without Keith? Is Charlie not every bit as important to the legacy and history of the Rolling Stones as Keith is? Well, I, I think that they're, I, I think it's not that simple. And I am, Definitely, you know, applying a healthy dose of of speculation here. But I, you know, this tour was booked and rescheduled. And so there's insurance companies involved and huge cash outlays involved. There's a great Bob Lefsetz article uh, on, or, you know, note in the Lefsetz letter recently talking about the touring business and, and COVID's effect on the touring business. And he said, yeah. you, you know, what most people don't understand is that let's say a band goes out and does 25 dates. Those first 20 dates, the band, like nobody makes anything that covers all your costs for the tour. And, you know, the only money you make is the last five dates. But he made he made very certain to note that those last five dates, given that they are 100 percent profit, can be extremely lucrative, like, like very, very, very lucrative and obviously make it worthwhile. His point was, but if COVID and, and or wildfires or, you know, anything else cause you to lose even just two or three dates in the middle of a tour. Now, suddenly the whole thing can be a wash or worse. Right. Yeah. And, and so my guess is that the stones, you know, would the Stones have, will the Stones book another tour after this one is really the question. I, certainly they could have pulled the plug on this without Charlie, but, but Charlie, Charlie bailed out before he passed away. Right. It was, it was very much the, you know, reminded me a lot of Steve Jobs, right. When he was like, Oh, Tim Cook's going to take over while I, you know, deal with some health stuff. And then boom, you know, he passed away. Same kind of thing with Charlie, right? You know, we're going to have Steve Jordan play. It's going to be great. I'll be back when I can. And then, no, you won't. Um, well, I mean, so, you know, how, how much did they know and how much they didn't know? That, of course. That and I would also say the money is almost definitely put up by corporate backers for Rolling Stones tours. And definitely. I, I just say, in terms of the legacy of one of the all-time greatest groups of all time, mm-hmm. this, this feels icky to me. I would not go see this band. I, and, and I actually think... Again, they wouldn't if, if if it was Keith, would they put another guitar player up there? No way. No, no way. way. No. I, I Charlie I agree is with every that. bit as important. Every yeah. Charlie is every bit as important to who the stones are. So nothing against Jordan, nothing against you know, anybody. Oh, Just like yeah. this makes no sense to me that, you know, you're dealing with legacies and history and and you know, so anyway, that's just my Yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder what that conversation went like where when Charlie decided or was told, you know, you can't go do this tour. I, I wonder if it was at his urging that the band continued the tour. Like, look, I don't want to be the one to postpone this yet again. Right. Cause it is, it would have been again. Um, and maybe for the third time it would have been right. Cause it was rescheduled and then pushed back later in the year this year. So, you know, he probably, I, I wonder, somebody certainly felt like we don't want to postpone this again. I wonder if 
Charlie was the one leading that charge. We may never know, or, you know, never it, may, know. it may come out when, when Keith is 150 and actually spills all the beans about <laughs> everything. <laughs> but, you know, at net net, we can speculate on moving parts, but at the end of the day, it's, yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it's not, it's, it's less the legacy. The yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the legacy of one of the greatest bands all time. So that's yeah. tough. It's interesting. Hey, I played a couple of gigs this past weekend. Yeah. How'd those go? Um, uh, good. So, uh, I played, uh, one solo acoustic gig under a nice tree at a very high end shopping center that, you know how, I don't know about where you are, but out here, it seems like there's a trend towards shopping centers are much more experiential, right? You know, so that's definitely, dude, you guys live in such a weird little bubble out oh, in yeah. California. You, you came and saw it. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, I saw so, that shop. In fact, I saw you under that tree. I have yeah. pictures of this. Yeah. That's, that doesn't happen here. No. Yeah. And then, um, I played the next day I played, uh, with Simon. Um, oh, nice. So that was good too. Um, I did a little solo set. My first time I've actually done a street side gig, uh, you know, Simon is kind of the king of those things and he has taken this one area and, and he's the mayor of that town. I mean, he invites all <laughs> different types of people to come. You, you were one of them anyway. So that was cool. But then I had a house rockers gig on Sunday and that's what I want to talk about today because it, there's a bunch of interesting lessons there. So sure. this is the gig that, um, pays poorly, Okay, but is a huge like you crazy. playing this for exposure is what you're trying to say we pay it to because there's so much love from the not only the people who book oh. us so it's a you know it's a, it's a, it's a Kiwanis group so yep. you know I don't feel as bad because they they take the money and they that they you know it's not like they're pocketing the money they're they're putting it into good social causes in the town and I think that's a fine thing sure but nothing wrong with that yeah it is, it's become, we've done this show for 17 years and uh, it has become a crazy house rocker love fest where, you know, people come and, you know, they're, they're lining up and they're, you know, they're, they're getting their chairs out. It's, you know, six in the morning and, you know, all sorts of things. And so every year I'm like, Oh, you know, it's hard. This gig is hard. And I'll explain that in a bit, but, but man, you know, I don't know of a single gig where we get this much, adulation, you know, and it is, it is very rewarding and it would be, it would, it's, it's hard to walk away from that. It's not always about the money is lesson one. Number two. It's not, it's not a terrible thing to stroke the ego every now and then. Right. Absolutely. I, I Absolutely. mean, it, like it, it's good to walk away from a gig and feel good about having entertained people like that's, well, that's it's a also like, yeah. it's also a vibe yeah. that not many bands in this area, um, uh, get right. So there's not a lot of, of, of gigs and bands that have gigs that have been doing them as long as we've been doing this one where it's your gig, like you own this gig. Right. And yeah. you know, literally thousands of people are going to be there anyway, but it's a festival gig and festival gigs mean they're typically giving us a 30 minute changeover. We've talked about the difficulties with changeovers like that with a 10 piece band sure. with as much wireless as we have. Right. Yep. Anyway, We've done this for so long, you know, the way that these festivals work is that they hire a sound company and the sound company provides sound for all bands for all days, all, all day Saturday and all day Sunday. Well, we get to ours and, you know, we knew the band before us and, and you know, great people and they get off in a fairly um, uh, expedient way. We get our stuff on stage and stuff little things start to go wrong. Like, like the, <laughs> we're noticing that the, the presence and gain in the monitors are not quite there. We thought we were having a wireless <clears throat> problem. Turned out it was a routing problem at this other guy's board. So, you know, we have a bill and bill tries to mitigate as many of these things as he can, but you've got 10 guys scrambling to get on stage, uh, trying to make sure your stuff works for you and then trying to get some kind of sound. And then, you know, the guy trying to get a line check and usually they, they kind of get it close for the first song and they kind of mix on it. So, so that's a front of house thing. That's a different thing. But yep. th this was, this was particularly egregious. Like we, we, we played really well and, you know, we gave a good show, but almost to a man, as we walked off, guys were shaking their head. Like I couldn't, you know, I can't give my best if I can't hear myself. And so, you know, things like uh, our sax player, who we feature quite a bit, he would go to blow a solo, and clearly the guy was trying to run a fader 
to raise his solo up in the house and it went up in the guy's in ears and blew him out. And this happened often. And so, you know, routing issues with a 10 piece band with as much stuff as we have is, is an issue. Routing issues no. with a three piece band is an issue, it, especially yeah. those kinds of routing issues. I, yeah, no, no, that's I, I, there are few moments where I have considered pulling the plug mid gig and at, it, at least two of them are exactly related to that. If you're going to start blowing us out on stage, we need to stop and have a conversation like this right. cannot happen. Yep. Yep. So, so, you know, the guys were mixed. Like I like that gig, but I can't do that. I don't want to sound bad and I don't want to play bad. And so, you know, there's all this conversation. So we started breaking it down and the guy who, uh, who is the sound company. Now we've worked with him a couple of times before. I think he's one of those guys who, um, he has really good gear. Um, I think he's a church sound guy, which is a whole different type of controlled environment, right? Yep. That's, that's different than an on the fly live, you know, type of thing. Um, it's probably closer to a theater gig, right? Doing, doing worship sound. I mean, probably you're doing sound in the same space over and over again. And, and yeah, you have different needs in terms of, where the vocals sit in relation to the instruments. And I, I would, yeah, I, I'm sure I haven't done a whole lot of church gigs. It's been, I actually did quite a few of them, but I was like, you know, before I was 20. So it's right. been a while, <laughs> right? but yeah, so, it's a similar thing. Like you have different things you need to be sensitive to. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, but this is again, one of those things where everybody feels a little bit of stress and pressure to get on stage. You know, Russ has a drum kit to set up and, yeah. you know, and so you start to noodle and that kind of gets in the way of doing line checks. And there's just a lot of commotion, you know, trying to use that 30 minutes wisely. It took us 45 to play and the mixing still wasn't right. right. Like we couldn't. Right. So, you, you know, then you make a call. How much of your time are you going to eat into? Is it good enough? And yeah. then, you know, you make that kind of subjective call because that's the way these gigs are. And sure enough, one of my horn guys was like, hey, you know, yes, it was a fun gig. People liked us. When you listen back, if you hear intonation problems, we could hear nothing. Right. right. So, you know, he, and he was more like, you know, sometimes that's the way it is. The one guy who we call on the solo quite a bit, he was quite upset. I can see that. And yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, there's all different, you know, acceptances for, for the thing. So let's just kind of back this up. I'm going to put you in project manager mode. And I want you to walk me through, you know, my band well enough having played with us and yep. knowing me and knowing most of the guys, I want you to walk me through an orderly process for, for putting my, so, so what I'm describing yeah, to you I, is, I got you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So all right, let's do, okay. Let's do this. The first thing I'm going to do though, is I want to talk about our sponsor band Zoogle. Uh, and Please. Banzoogle is where you are going to go to create your website, electronic press kit, your online presence for your band, or even, you know, just for you, if you're a, a solo musician or however you want to do it. And in fact, you could do it for both you as a solo musician and your band, like Banzoogle hosts lots of people's websites and it's not just that they are a host. They really let you manage it. They've built this whole engine that makes it super simple. And it's not just a generic engine. It's an engine built by musicians for musicians. So they know what you want and they know how to make it so that you don't have to be a web expert. They're the web experts. They're also the musician's website experts. And so they just give you everything to just plug in and go. They've got all these templates and everything that are super easy to use and customize so that you really can make your presence and your website look like it's yours. And speaking of it looking like it's yours, you can have them host your domain name so that you have, you truly have your own, you know, .com or .co or .net or whatever it is that you choose to use. They've also got commission-free tools to sell your music and merch, commission-free crowdfunding and subscription features for your fans, commission-free uh, it, uh, uh, well, like I said, I guess they're selling your merch and all that stuff. And they've also got mailing list tools so that you can grow and manage your fans and communicate with people. And speaking of communication, live support from Banzoogle's musician friendly, oftentimes musician team seven days a week. 
As a GigGab listener, you can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and then use the promo code GigGab, all one word, to get 15% off your first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com and then promo code GigGab, G-I-G-G-A-B, all one word, all lowercase. That gets you your 15% off. Our thanks to Banzoogle for doing what they do and sponsoring this episode. Yeah. Love Banzoogle. Absolutely. All right, so how, if I were in your band, really what I want to do is bring Russ Miles from Fling into this because he is our logistics master. Uh, if you think I am a logistics freak, then it's only because you haven't worked with Russ. And uh -uh. I, I use the word freak in a very positive way. It's, um, it, for example, with, with Fling, when we were in our, like, you know, gigging, you know, regularly mode, we worked out a whose car pulls in first and who, with, what gear is in which car? And we'd all start unloading. And then as soon as we got to a certain point in the unloading process, one of us would peel off from that and start setting up the lights because we would build the stage from back to front. And then another guy would start taking my drums out of their cases while I was building my rack. And we truly like it. it we could get in and out in well under 45 minutes with fling from nothing to ready to go. Things are easier, though, when you're doing your own sound because you get to you control the whole widget, right? It, there is a lot of predictability in the system. What you're talking about is a lot of unpredictability. You can't really know up front where things are going to be, because even if it's a, a team you've worked with before, the band that played before you had different needs. And so, you know, microphones and all of the shared resources that they're going to be moving around are going to be different, right? Unless it just yeah. so happens. And so, yeah, the, I, I would say, I, you know, it's almost like you want to take a look, zoom out, right? Look at what you would do if you were setting up for yourselves and then look at that and say, okay, if all we need to do is play one hour, right? One set at a festival, let's look at everything we have here and what can we get rid of? Like, what don't we need Without affecting the show, right? So could that be, you know, do your horn player, I, and, I, and I'm just making things up, but, you know, if one horn player plays three different types of horns or whatever, can we just standardize the gig and do it on one horn so that we don't have to worry about level checking all three of them? Can, uh, you know, can the keyboard player use one keyboard? I, I, like, and, and those answers might be no, no, this is part of our show. We have to have those things. Okay, great. Well, let's just keep looking through and what can each of those things be? And one of those things can be, you know, does it make sense for everybody to be wireless at a gig like that? Like, can we give up the wireless part so that we're not fighting that battle? Is that possible or not possible? Right. And so mm -hmm. that's how I would. And again, all of these are sort of compromises, but you're already like you are already in a compromised scenario here. Right. Like you started 15, 20 minutes late. Things still weren't perfect. Where were the problem spots? And that's what I would look at first, especially if you've got a history of, okay, we've done this five times this season. Every time we've run into problems or three of the five times we've run into problems with this, two of the five times it's been that. And then one time we lost 20 minutes to this really weird thing that we don't ever, we've never seen before and we don't never see again. I wouldn't necessarily worry about that, right? Like that's, it sucked. It, it ruined a gig or almost ruined a gig, but eh, you know, it's not. It was yeah. just a yeah, like freak things happen, says the drummer who got to a gig and his hi hat stand wouldn't tighten on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, can, do will I will I now plan to bring a spare hi hat stand with me? No, like that that it doesn't make any sense. I have it's a one off. It's a one off, right? And and so you just deal with it in the moment. And I was able to. And then of course, as soon as we were set up, I grabbed my phone and I ordered a new hi hat stand. Uh, so it'll be here this week. But, um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you don't want this to happen again. Uh, but, you, you know, looking at, at all of the sort of issues that you have, and this is something that you probably do in your band just as a byproduct of, of being, you know, conscientious people. Like, individually, we all do this with our gear. Like, okay, how can I simplify my own setup, right? And then you look at that at, you know, kind of a holistic level as the band. How can I simplify this? And you've probably got that down to a point where it, it doesn't need to be refined anymore for the gigs that you're doing sound. But I would, you know, take a look and say, okay, what can we do? What can't we do? I come back to what Dan Meblin 
um, from Pop Fiction described to us a couple of years ago where every gig that they play, they use their rack. A hundred percent of their inputs go into their rack and all monitors are fed from that rack. And yeah, so mixed, let me pause here because it's mixed important. by that so, rack. Yeah. Yeah. So for some reason, <clears throat> I think it was a lack of an of a of an analog um, splitting box. Yeah. We couldn't do that. Sure. Right? So, well, he th- that's the thing. Dan always brings his split tails. So they're uh, in, th- th- right. So I, but again, my guess is that wasn't always the case, right? He got to a gig, probably experienced exactly what you did, and was like, all right, we'll deal. But also never again. And then he went out and, you know, on maybe after he got to, well, he wouldn't have time after he got set up. So maybe after the gig, he gets on his phone and he orders a bunch of split tails and builds that into his system so that it, yeah. that no longer is a friction point. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. so l- let me give a little more context to this. So what Bill always does is he always contacts the, the sound system, the sound company, provides him a stage plot. Um, tries to talk them through, you know, it's a big band and there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of wireless and, you know, tries to talk to them almost, almost universally. They don't look at the stage plot in advance, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and actually he tries to see if they have a Midas board like we have and tries to provide them with our profile, right? Yeah. You know, so he has a saved scene, you know, and that's what, yeah. something that Midas boards can do. And, and so, so Bill's trying to, you know, ease the friction as much as possible. But in general, you know, in general, it's hard to get people's attention to p- take that seriously. Right. Yep. Um, so that's one thing. And then again, this, the next thing is, uh, you know, how do we can get control of our own, of our own, you know, monitor mix at the very least, Yeah. Like, you know, Bill, Bill will a- always offer to bring a board and do that type of stuff. And, you know, sound people are, it always or, depends. Uh, yep. Yes. And, then, and actually, Bill is a pretty pretty darn good at um, making friends and providing help. That's and, the you know, key. making them yeah. look successful. And he knows that that's what he's trying to do. And that's how he positions it is like, you know, I want to help you guys. I'm an extra hand. I'll throw gear around. You know, he, he, all these types of things. And Bill is quite good at this stuff. But again, I just, you know, the nature of the beast is rarely do you have sound companies who do a lot of advanced prep, right? So, yes, in our situation... I, I don't know too much that we could do without, I, I you know, like our sure. horns c- come up to the front to take their solos. And if the, and if the situation is right, they'll go in the audience as part of our show and that type of thing, as will me, you know, with my, with my uh, wireless guitar and, and that type of stuff. Yeah. This, uh, uh, what we have learned here is that we have to require the sound company to provide the splitting capability. And we have to require that. And, and again, this gig is particularly interesting because when I say, or you can, or you can build it into your system, right? There you go. I mean, like either one, but you need to have it there. Yeah, 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 for sure. And so this gig is particularly interesting because when I was saying to you, we get a lot of love, all those people who come to be part of this gig and see us play buy a lot of beer and wine. Mm. We have a little leverage, you know, with the people who put this event on, they love having us. They love what we do playing there. We make them a lot of money. Plus we give them a good reputation as a fun festival to, you know, for people yeah. to come to. Right. So, you know, there's a little bit of leverage there, but yes, you're right. I, and I don't even know any, any idea. What is the ballpark we're talking about for having these splitter devices, hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars? Oh, I think you're in the hundreds, man. Okay. I, yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. You, Cause you just need, you just need to be able to essentially split each input and send one to your board that manages, you know, your in ears, your monitors, and then another feed out to, whatever front of house wants and and then they can do whatever the heck they want with that. Hopefully mix your show. But that way, when you it, when you set the gains for your monitors or more importantly, when they start mucking about with gains in front of house, it's not changing anything about your monitor mixes. And that is where, especially with in ears, things can get really dangerous really quickly is if somebody starts, if you start touching gains in the middle of a show, you better darn well know what you're doing uh, if you've got people on in ears. And most engineers I've worked with, especially recently, you know, this year, well, not last year, but, you know, past few years, it's not rare. You know, when we show up at a gig, I, I'm always really, I'm, it is my my very strong preference to use in ears, as anybody who listens to this show knows. But I do not 
overly impose that on I, I try not to communicate how strongly I feel about wanting to use ears. You know, yeah. I just show up and I'm like, hey, I, I know you probably got the stage plot. I'm not sure if you saw if it's possible to get me a feed for my ears. That would be great. And a hundred percent of the time, certainly this year, everybody's been like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Like, it, I'm definitely not the only one. It Like, and if I rewind 10 years, I was definitely the only one in like the, you know, local band circuit that was doing it. They're like, oh, well, what do you need? And like, you know, and I had to come up with actually I, I used a, um, a, a, what I forget. I don't know what you'd call it. But it's a box that would take a powered, a, like an amplified signal to a, a passive wedge and turn it into a headphone output mm -hmm. so that, you know, if somebody had power or, you know, passive wedges with amps to, to feed them on stage, I could just take the quarter inch out of the back of that, throw it into this thing and plug my headphones in and, and it never blew my head up, which was great. Uh, but, you know, like having to go and get that kind of gear is no longer necessary for, for that kind of thing. But. Um, but like they understand it now, but you need to like, you need to protect yourself. And so I, yeah, I think, I think doing those split tails would be a great idea for, yep. for your band. Yeah. All right. Now, now let's just, I just, last part of this is what happens is, is that when the, when the setup doesn't go smooth, uh, people start to noodle noodling, I think is actually not professional, you know, and, and, but I get it. Everybody wants to like tune their stuff and, you know, check yeah. the sound and you know, all this type of stuff, but noodling in general, you know, no, it's a bad. Little tolerance. It is, but the little tolerance in these kind of festival things. Although when you go to a show that has multiple bands, you don't hear much noodling. In no, you bands. don't. You, no, right. No. And I mean, some of that might be because it's not coming out front of house, right? Like, it, it, so it's not being, it's not being reinforced with the, with the front of house system, the noodling. So you may just not notice it, but also there is a way, you know, when we're, when I was saying you need to look at your setup process and, and make it efficient. That also includes the, you know, the human element, the, 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 the spot between the, the microphone and the instrument, right? Like being aware of how you can be efficient and then stop. Like if you've got everything you need, sit and wait for the next phase of it or help the other guy. If, you know, if there's, if that can be involved in the oh, process too. So get off stage, I think actually. And that's actually, I don't go on stage until they're ready to, you know, to, yeah. you know, so, you know, Bill will set my amp and my pedal board, which is all cool. And that's I'm awesome. last, usually the last person on stage. Right. Yeah. And I, and I kind of think the way that it should be is the horn should go on you know, maybe let the drums set up or let everybody get their stuff on yeah. and then get off stage until, it, you know, is that practical? Get off stage until it's, you know, time to work on your particular stuff. Cause guys, you know, it's the individual musicians want to kind of check their own gear. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you, I, I mean, I, I'm sure there's, there's a, a path where that makes sense. I, I don't know that that would be something universal, but I think, knowing your spot and staying out of everyone else's like if I'm if I'm on stage and sitting at my drums I'm not in anyone's way unless it's the engineer that's trying to mic my drums and then I clear out of there right like I, I you know and I've definitely had that we I think when we did the music hall this summer the team was like get yourself set up on stage and then please clear the stage we're gonna go and set mics and then you can come back up and we'll do a sound check. And, uh, right. and that, yeah, so that worked fine. But it, it uh, you know, I think it's just self-awareness, right? Knowing, am, look around, read the room. Am I contributing by standing here, neutral by standing here, or am I in the way by standing here? And if the sure. answer is in the way, well, change that. Get out of the way. Yeah. 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 So, but you've got, I mean, self-awareness is not necessarily a thing that everybody in the world has. And, and that, yeah, but I just kind of reflect upon, <laughs> upon what, you know, we, we touch often about what makes a professional musician yeah. and, you know, it's not just chops and reading music, it's attitude and approach to getting the show done. Right. Right. Uh, prep preparation, you know, cooperation, all those types of things are really part and parcel of what a, a pro would do. Right. Yes. You know, and uh, I think that, well, what about me and what about my sound and what about that stuff? That has to be tempered with the overall big picture of things, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you, certainly someone needs to worry about your sound and, and you are a good candidate for that job. But it can't, it, it, like you said, it has to be part of the overall thing. You can't spend 
you know, I can't spend 20 minutes saying, oh, we really got to get my snare drum sound perfect in the mains. It's like, well, we don't have time for that today, Dave. You know, yeah. you get your snare drum sounding the way you want on stage and then hit it a bunch of times until the engineer tells you to stop hitting it. And now you're finished. You, you know, like keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. All right. So, yeah. hey, um, that was that was my weekend. What was your weekend? Uh, I had a, let's see, I had a, I had the bitter pill gig at corner point brewery, the people who make bitter pills beer, uh, in our <laughs> name and with our logo, uh, we played there Sunday afternoon. That's the gig where my hi hat pedal, um, or hi hat stand showed me how it had changed the way it operates, uh, when I started setting up. So that was fun. But thankfully I had a little, uh, stand lock that I could tighten into position and hold it. So it, it, it really didn't affect me for the gig, but I'm, I'm not, uh, obviously I'm never going to bring that stand to a gig again. So, uh, but that's fine. That's how these things work. It doesn't owe me anything, but the gig went really well. I, um, we were, we do our own sound at that one and we've done our own sound. You know, we played, I think 17 gigs now this summer with bitter pill and we've probably done our sound at, at, you know, 10 of those 17. And, I had a few minutes as I, after I'd loaded up the car, um, but before I had to leave. So I grabbed the mixer and I just took a look at sort of gains and levels. And as I was looking at my own monitor mix, it's like, you know, everything has just been like crept up over the summer. I always just save it after each gig. Cause it's like, well, if I get it somewhere, that's, that's a good place to start for the next one. And so I brought everything down about 10 DB um, and figured I can, you know, sort of bring it back up. So I gave myself the, you know, just a, a sort of rough mix and really, I, I mean, I say I brought it down 10 dB. That was the net effect, but I really just started everything at zero and just kind of put it where I, I, I thought it would be and it. It wound up being low and um, man, like my ears sounded fantastic with that much headroom. Mm. It really, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I got to do this more often, you, you know, cause it's, it wasn't just a cluttered crowded mix. Of course I was also, you know, listening to my ears in stereo, which I get to do when we do our own sound. And that is also wonderful because it lets me keep things quieter when I can, you know, have things not all just competing for space in the middle. Uh, band played really well. We had, uh, we had, it was a nice afternoon yet again, the weather participated in the bitter pill scene and uh, we had a lovely new England afternoon. It was, I mean, it felt like a summer afternoon. It was like, you know, high seventies and, it was a summer afternoon, you know, because that's how the dates work and seasons yep. and all that. But yep. yeah, we had a we had a good gig. It was we've been putting different songs in the set list and mixing things up a little bit. And um the band's playing well. Everybody's, you know, kind of synced up and we all know basically what's gonna happen when somebody does something and mm -hmm. uh, you know, predictable. Not not that the show is is stale by <laughs> not by any stretch. There's always there's always surprises, but it um you know, we know each other. We're a band and we've, yep. you know, we played a bunch this summer and that really has cemented a lot of things. You know, when we started this summer, I was pulling up cheat sheets for a lot of tunes just to remind myself, okay, where's the break in this one? Where's, you know, how's this work? How's that work? And other than the brand new tunes where I still might have a cheat sheet on stage, like, uh, you know, like we all just know all our songs and it's, we're playing them it's like, a great like feeling. a band. Yeah, it is a great feeling. It, it really is. All the hard work sort of pays off and it, it was, it's, it's been good. Um, we have, uh, we had an interesting, so you're looking for a bass player or you have a sub bass player that may or may not, you know, wind up being your, your full-time bass player. It depends on how things yeah. go. Uh, in fling Burke came to us, earlier this week and informed us that his, uh, it was a very heart heartfelt thing. Um, as he pointed out, he spent, you know, one fifth of his life in fling and, uh, he is moving on to other things. Our focus on originals and his desire to be more of, I, I, I honestly, he didn't say this, but I, I, I really think he would love playing in like some sort of grateful dead tribute band or something like that. And I think he wants to move into that direction, and so Burke is no longer in fling. And so we've been reaching out to some bass playing friends here in the New Hampshire seacoast to kind of start seeing how that evolution will go. Um, it, it, the, the last gig that we played, which is the gig I talked about last week, we were both bitter pill and fling played uh, back to back that really kind of energized. Well, it energized four fifths of us <laughs> evidently. Um, mm. And, but that's, but like, it it's a really nice piece, like bit of momentum to have to carry us through 
having to replace, you know, a member. So, yeah. and if, and if he wasn't jazzed about that gig and the four of us were, then he has made the right decision. You, you know what I mean? Like that, that was definitely heading in the direction that we're all really excited about. I mean, Russ uh, has been driving the bus on, on really prioritizing flings originals, but uh, like everybody in the band is, is very much behind it. And so we're, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a speed bump to have, to, as you well know, to have to replace a member, but um, we're all. Especially a longtime member. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, we've, I've replaced guys who just haven't worked out sure. in a short period of time. And it's an inconvenience, but it's a different thing. But yeah, someone who is part of the chemistry of your group and, and uh, you know, that's hard. And it takes, it takes a good unit who's united in the, in the quest, yes. right? You know, Yes. I find that actually there are, there's a personality type of musicians who's just kind of skeptical that a band is ever going to stay together. <laughs> and they're kind of always looking, you know, they're kind of like prepared for the other shoot, shooter drop all the time. Well, I think know, that's, and, I think that's um, what we call seasoned musicians, right? Wasn't it mm. Timothy B. Schmidt who said every band is on the verge of breaking up at all times. Right. Right. And, and I think there's, there's truth to that, it, I mean, it's it's obviously a generalization, so it's not true. But th there's a reason that that phrase resonates with so many of us. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a and, fragile thing, be, right? It, it is a fragile thing. Yeah. It, is, it is a delicate thing. Delicate, and, yeah. You know, I I am in the process of replacing a guy who was almost since the very beginning, and yeah. you know, he he and and the guy that we have is he's an excellent musician his tone is really good he's is right. great at preparation i mean there's there's so many upsides to him and the process to some degree and this is why we did it the way we did we were like hey let's call this a long term sub i'm going to guarantee you 4 months of gigs so sure. you know for the time you're going to put in and then let's see if we like each other and let's have a good honest conversation at the end of it because yeah. he may not, he may not like what he sees with us you may you know or, 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 you know, the time commitments or the rehearsal commitments. We, we lost a good guitar player many years ago because he, he just didn't want to rehearse. And we were, you know, we were constantly looking for that perfect blend of, of great material, right? Like, yeah. you know, and we threw out a bunch of stuff that we would bring into rehearsal because it wasn't, you know, it, it didn't get where we needed it to go. But, yeah, Chris, who's playing for us is, is you know, he, and, and t it took the first month or so of reminding ourselves different is not better nor worse. That's right. right. So that, that's yeah. one, that's one yeah. benchmark. And then the second thing is enjoy the different sometimes, right? Well, that's, like, like you need to you it, hear some you things have that to. are like, Hey, yeah. you know, when, when Russ joined the band, you know, Russ is a great technical drummer, little things like uh, the song smooth and the song um, superstition. Yeah. Those are very specific drum parts, right? Yeah. And, 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 I'd never heard them in our band played that way before. And they made old songs feel new to me again. And that was something really to enjoy, right? You might so, as well enjoy it because it it is going to be different, right? Like, yeah. like, but like you said, it and different is, well, it's true that different is neither better nor worse, but it's also both better and worse, right? There are going to be things where it's like, oh, okay, well, I miss, I miss the way we used to do that. Okay, fine. Here's the new way. And then some of the things like you said, are going to be like, wow, this is, this is better. And all of that's okay. And I, I think it's really smart to give yourself permission to experience all of that because, you know, especially, you know, with us and fling Burke's uh, still a friend. I mean, there wasn't some, you know, blow up or anything like that. He was just like, this is going in a direction that I'm not feeling it, I've been thinking this way for a while and I think it's time. And it's like, okay. I mean, and to be fair, none of this came as a huge shock to any of us. Right. It was like, yeah, you know, we've all can be, kind of been aware and trying to, to, to figure out how to piece this together. And, sure. um, you know, so, but it, 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 there, it, there was no blow up. It wasn't anything, you know, it was just like, it's time. It's like, okay, great. But, and, and so, you know, here's our friend, and if we, and we haven't played with anybody new yet, but we probably will this weekend. And I'm sure there will be moments where it's like, oh, dude, you're playing that. Like, I like this better. And it's okay to experience that. And I, like, I say this to everybody out there as much as I say it to myself, right? Like, it's going to be okay because it's just how it is. And, and, and so, and so it goes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would, saw, I, 
I, I saw the, the, the Trey Anastasio band on uh, this weekend and they were playing their first gigs since pandemic. Um, their bass player passed away a few months ago. Now their bass player was the first member of the band. He was the guy Trey called when he said he wanted to start his own or experiment with this own thing. And then this guy, Tony Markellis, who was the original bass player brought in, uh, Russ Lawton, who's the drummer and, and then sort of other people, you know, join the band as, as things progressed. That band was very much rooted around the style that that guy played. And, and he really defined the way that band grooved. And when he passed away, everybody was like, okay, well, this is definitely going to be different. Like there's no way it's going to be the same, nor should you try to make it the same, right? Get somebody that, that fits, but it's going to be different. And they, they picked up this guy, a younger guy named Desron Douglas. And I had never heard him play before. I'd never heard of him before. Uh, he's kind of been in, in that circle for a while, uh, which is how everybody there knew him. Man, that first gig, like he dominated. Crushed. And uh. He crushed it. And it was like, oh, I like uh, it, personally, I like him better in this band than, than the old guy. Now the old guy was fantastic. It, you know, it wasn't that he was bad, but this is a, like, this is a new thing for that band. And this guy, I mean, it's like, I mean, he's got that sort of, you know, funkier Jocko style kind of thing. The other, the other guy was very rhythmic too, which was sort of important. You couldn't bring just a truly melodic bass player in that would, the band would, would change too much, I think. But, but this guy, you know, he was laying it down. I was like, oh man, like I'm loving this. And you could tell, yeah. you could tell everybody was like, all right, yeah, this is how it is. And, um, it's okay. You know, it's fine. Well, I, yeah. I, I fling in a similar situation. There's a difference between bringing in a bunch of guys to audition. Yep. Right. Yep. And then picking one. But we have the luxury of actually saying, you know, prepare a couple songs, mm -hmm. you know, and, and come play with us. Here's a third part that has been really useful. We learning, we're learning a lot about communication. So yes, different is neither good nor better. However, when there are some things that are, are really important, you know, like we have a couple of very unique arrangements that we worked really hard on. Sure. Um, when we send a guy a, a, you know, set of songs to learn, you know, there's kind of like first degree of learning, second degree of learning, deep learning type stuff. Right. Yeah. So they kind of get the gist of it. Right. So the question is, is when someone comes in and plays the gist of something, but you want something specific, how does that get communicated to someone? Mm. Right. And how do they take that? Right. So someone coming into an established band that has worked out things, it's not all play what you want. Sometimes, sometimes. No, the band no is there's some tunes you've got to play the way we play them. That's right. for the absolute. Oh, of course. And I, I can tell you, I mean, I've, I've subbed with plenty of bands. I've, I've been the, you know, second or third drummer to join plenty of bands and, and like coming in, you know, that they're like you, you, and you have to, I always ask, I'm like, okay, you know, tell, tell me if you know off the top of your head, great. But also if we're playing a tune and you realize that what I am playing for it is wrong for reasons that might not be obvious to me, or even if they should be obvious to me, but it's still wrong. Tell me like, well, there's a little subtlety to this though, David, and as, as it, that's you because that's how you approach, approach, approach communication. What I'm saying here is there are some people who would be like, Hey, I'm me. I'm not the other guy to which there's a level of finesse of saying, I get it. You know, we want you to be you, not the other guy. Yeah. However, this is a part. This you know, is this a is, part. Yeah. Some people will yeah. hear that. Some people will not hear that. Yeah. Well, and that's a good litmus test, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, then, the, uh, if at the end of the communicate. Yeah. At the end of the day, like you need to be able to, to say, this is how we play this song. And, and you know, I mean, if somebody has got an idea, Oh, well we, you know, can we try ending it this way? If the band is open to that, sure, try it. But then, you know, somebody's got to be the decision maker there. Yeah. And and it's usually not the new guy. Right. Yeah. You know, I I um I this is not a, a sub opportunity, but I I I played last night I rehearsed for the first time with this project that is uh it's my friend Stu Dias, who is um, he's a, a, a member of, I, I would say he was the band leader of this band called the soggy poor boys. I could be wrong about that, but from the outside, that's certainly the way it looks. Um, but he is 
doing this series once a month at a club here in uh, in Portsmouth called the Press Room. He's doing a cover of an album. And he asked me to come in and play percussion for Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. And so, and sang some harmonies with him too. And so, um, which is a great record to play percussion on, man. I mean, like there's just so much, it's all groove, right? Like the whole, I mean, there's moments that have to be those moments because otherwise it's not a song. It's just a groove, but, um, but it really is fun. I, it's the first time that I've had a gig that actually like calls for me using a talking drum in probably decades. Uh, I can't remember the last time that I, I was supposed to be playing a talking drum on a gig. So, um, so it's been, it was a blast and we rehearsed for the first time last night. I had no idea what I was walking into with this. It, you know, I mean, I knew what songs to play cause I can read the track list of the record and, but I, you know, Stu hadn't really communicated what his vision for reproducing the album was until essentially until we got there. And I didn't know I, I, I started to suss out the names of the other musicians because I was on an email trail with presumably everyone, <laughs> but I, I didn't know. I know one of these people. Um, I, and I didn't know the other guys at all. I, I was aware of them peripherally, but you know, last time, last night was the first night I met any of them. And there were a couple of moments where things were, you, so you have to navigate those waters very carefully. It's like, okay, well, here's, Clearly, it was it was obvious to me that pretty much the the rhythm section, bass player, drummer, and we have a we have an actual B three player playing an actual B three, which wow. is freaking oh, being on stage with a B three, it's been so long, it's amazing. And then we have an or a, a, a electric piano player, bass drums, and then Stu plays guitar. And those guys, I, I think they are all Soggy Po Boys members. If they're not, they've played together other times. So it's like oh. I'm kind of the odd one out. I've played with Stu a few times and you know, it's it, everybody was very welcoming, but they have a way of working together, right? Clearly like it's just how bands are, even though this is not a band project, it very much was okay. I'm, I need to figure out how to get involved here. But then there were, you know, there was a moment where like the drummer didn't quite grok the groove of a tune the right way. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I better step up and and communicate this. And I was like, I hope I'm doing it in a way that the last 25 minutes has taught me is going to work in this particular ensemble, right? And uh, and it did. And he was like, Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. And and everybody was like, Right, I get it. And then you know, I became the one counting off that tune. It was like, Okay, well, this is interesting. I just expected to be the side guy, but you know, you you find your points where it were at least for me. Okay, in that moment, I'm I'm the guy that knows this song the best from that standpoint. So I'm just going to yeah. step in and and do this, but then also step out of the way, right? You know, and 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 let Stu be the band leader for the rest of the time, and and um and really just keeping the, and I I think this is you know to the point you were making, looking at what's the goal of the project and how can I serve that goal without stepping in the way of that goal, and. And sometimes it, most of the time it means following. And sometimes it means stepping up and being like, okay, but let me, let me carry us across this particular, you know, milestone. And then, all right, yeah. now let's keep on trucking, you know? And um, yeah, it's, but it's going to be a blast, man. It's really, what a fun record to play. Um, It's Very cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cool. I wasn't sure, you know, it was like, ah, oh, playing a whole cover record. I mean, sure. You know me, I can't say no to a gig. So it fit into my schedule and I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Sure. It'll be fun to play with new people. And like, that was, that was sort of my impetus for saying yes. And then as, as often happens after that first time playing together, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, in the moment, it's like, oh my God, this is my favorite thing, you know, but that's how it is when I'm playing any kind of music. Like whatever song, I'm, people always ask me, what's your favorite song? It's like, whatever one I'm playing. Like that's always right. You're a musician's musician, brother. Well, I, you know, I just like to play music. So, and I like to get better. I'd, I'd like to be a musician's musician. That's, that's where I, I don't, I don't know that I'm there yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. It's a good path to walk though. It is, man. Yeah, it is. It's always good to, and it's, you know, I I was, it was a little weird, like stepping into this thing with people that I know are serious players. And it's like, okay, I don't play, you know, I am not a primarily a hand drum percussion player. Like, am I going to be able to hang with these guys? <laughs> it was like question number one. And it worked out. It worked out great. So I was like, oh, sweet. I can hang with these guys. Cool. Like <laughs> that was a nice little thing to, to feel because it could have gone the other way very easily. 
Could have, could have been a disaster. Like, thanks for coming, Dave. Uh, yeah, don't worry about the rest of the rehearsals. It, it, we got this covered. With a, you know, it's fine. It was I, nice, I, nice to meet you. I can't see that ever happening to you. So. Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, you know, it, 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 I. It's always in the back of my head. Like, you know, like I need to deliver. Otherwise, that will be the result eventually. If I, if yeah. I, you know, if I let off the gas, yeah. Ah, <sighs> I don't know, man. You got anything else for today? I've got a, we've got a question about um, microphones and gear sort of, it was asked by a singing drummer, but, but there's a lot to, to go through. So I'm going to save Brian's question for next, uh, next yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. We're good, good for next stuff. Time. If you've got your questions about gear or anything else, or just comments you want to share feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We really, really love hearing from you. It, it, it makes our day, makes our week even. So for sure. Yeah. You got anything else, man? Or are we good to go? I'm good today. All right. Yeah. Same. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Thanks for sending in your stuff. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being you. And always be performing. Always be performing. Do you remember? Body off, folks. <laughs>